we're going to talk about adaptations today. Have you heard the word adaptations before? You might have come across it now and again. Let's talk about what that means, an adaptation. You might have heard the phrase things adapt or adapted to an environment, but what is an adaptation? As we talk about adaptations today, feel free to text into our online system. We have a phone number that you can text to. Remember, texting rates apply. My friend Luke is going to try and pull the number up. If not, I have a board I can show you the number. But that number, you can text in questions and one of our other staff that are here today. To... We'll do it this way. It's okay. Sometimes we have some technical difficulties in the studio. Uh, there we go. 562-786-5181. So if you text into this number, you can ask me a question while we're airing live, and we'll try and answer them to the best of our abilities. Have you thought about what an adaptation is? Let's think about it on ourselves. How do we survive? What things do we have on us that help us survive? Hmm. Is it my jacket? Is it a jacket an adaptation? It's not really part of me, but it does help. But there's other things that are similar. So maybe fingers. Our hair at one point helped us survive. We have feet to run on land. Other animals like birds have wings so they can fly around. But let's think about the aquatic animals, the animals in the ocean. My friend Luke, I think, is going to be able to pull up a webcam for us of one of our exhibits here inside the building. We have webcams that watch our exhibits all the time. And even if it's nighttime, there's a highlight reel of all the cool stuff that was going on before the nighttime. I think if we look at our tropical habitat, we'll get the widest variety of animals and things to look at. So let's see if we can find some parts of animals that help them survive. Now think about shapes, abilities, behaviors, even body parts that might help something survive. So let's take a look and We'll use some time to just observe. So we're all scientists here today. Even all of you at home, we're scientists. We're going to use our senses. So we're going to use our sight and our sound senses to look at things. There's one of our beautiful bonnet head sharks swimming around the front of us. What do you notice about the animals that help them survive? You can even think about the habitat these animals are in. This is a coral reef habitat. So that means warm water. Well, let's pick a really fun one out. The spotted eagle ray. Here we go. Spotted eagle rays can be very large, but they have very specific body parts that help them survive. If you look at the side of their head, they have these little holes that almost look like they should be ears behind their eyes. Oh, our spade fish are getting in the way. That's okay. There, there we go. Now the holes that are on the back of their head are kind of like our nose. How does our nose help us survive? We can breathe through our nose. That's very important. Well, rays will often sit on the floor of the ocean. If your face was in the floor of the ocean, would you be able to breathe easily? Not well. So you need an adaptation to help do that. So rays and sharks all have this spiracle, this part in the back of their head, that acts like a nostril. They can breathe in through there and blow the water out through their gill slits. That way they're not sucking in a sand while they're in the sea floor. Let's find out something else. What else do you notice helps some of these animals survive? Do you think I could win a swimming race against this bonnet head shark? I guarantee that I could not. So their fins help them swim, and that's an important adaptation when you live in the water. Now one of the questions we just got from our guests is what would happen if animals and people did not have adaptations? That's a good question to ask. When we talk about adaptations, we can classify them as good or bad. Sometimes there's a bad adaptation that it's not very helpful to survive in your habitat. Animals that naturally go extinct, meaning there's no more left in the, in the nature or anywhere, they sometimes have bad adaptations that it did not help them survive at all. Good adaptations do help that species survive longer. So if you had zero adaptations, Let's say nothing changed and something happened to the environment. So let's say this tropical reef got really cold, but you didn't have any ability to change how you survived. Do you think if they're used to really warm water, it'd be really easy to be in really cold water? 
Probably not. So ad having adaptations is good. Animals probably wouldn't survive very long if they had no adaptations or didn't adapt, and that's like an action, a verb. They're not changing their bodies even a little bit to help survive. And it could be as simple as finding different food. So if you were an animal that ate off of this coral body right here, you eat the algae that lives there, and no more algae grew there, you'd probably try to find more. That's even a thing that we can consider an adaptation is a behavior. Changing what you do in order to make sure you survive. Did you find anything else you want to talk about that might be a way to survive? We talked about the fins very briefly. Fins help them survive. Remember to text some questions into our number here at the bottom. Now, one of my favorite animals of the tropical reef doesn't even look like an animal. We'll talk about that, their adaptation. It's the coral. All this rocky structure is coral. It's an animal, but it has a little algae that lives inside of it. That's a really fun ability, is that you could have one organism, one living thing combined with another one, and you both benefit. That's called symbiosis. So if you can use another animal to help you survive, that can be a really fun way to live in your environment. Now, coral has that algae that lives inside of it. At night, coral sticks all their little tentacles out. They like to eat at night. And they grab the plankton that swims by. But in the daytime, they're not feeding, but they still need energy. Well, the sunlight's always around during the daylight. The algae uses that to make energy for both them and the coral. Now, we have a couple of shark questions. What is the fastest shark? I believe the fastest shark is the mako shark. They can swim about as fast as you can go on the highway, at least 50 miles an hour. Not all the time. Remember, it's kind of like a cheetah. They're going to use short bursts of energy to swim real fast or like a cheetah run real fast so they can capture their prey or escape something else. Now, the next question was, what are bonnet head adaptations? These are fun animals. So let's see if we can find a bonnet head that swims by. They're a little shy at the moment, but they're a type of hammerhead. So imagine a hammerhead. They have that really wide face. Their eyes are at the end. And when they swim, their head moves with their body. So if you imagine a shark swimming, they're not swimming like the little fish over here. When a shark swims, they move their tail. But hammerheads also move their head too. Their wide head gives them a couple of abilities. One, they can sense electricity even better than other sharks. Did you know that sharks can sense electricity? They have little parts of their face, little pores that can sense that. They're called ampullae of Lorenzini. So if there's something within about four inches of their body, they can tell if it's alive because there's electrical impulses that help everything move. So they can tell if something's alive. But if your face is bigger, you have even more of those ampullae to help you sense that electricity. One of my favorite parts about the bonnet head, oh, here we go, and other hammerheads, is that their head kind of acts like an airplane wing. Bonnet heads and other hammerheads can turn tighter corners as they swim because of the shape of their head. So not only can they sense more electricity from prey that's potentially in the front of them, they have a little bit better ability to swim in tight spaces and tight corners. Even the big great hammerhead that can get up to 19 feet long can swim in tighter circles than some of the other sharks can. All right, so this is a tropical habitat. What if we compared how things survive to a cold water habitat, like our blue cavern here at the Aquarium of the Pacific? The blue cavern habitat is not like this. So remember, this is tropical. Tropical reefs are very brightly colored. Lots of cool colors in here that we can find. But let's take a look at our blue cavern habitat real quick. And we'll see what differences are in that space. So I'll look bringing it up. Sophia had a question. Uh, how does algae breathe? That is an important thing to know because all living things have to use oxygen. Well, if you're an organism like a plant or an algae and you make oxygen, do you still breathe? Are you still exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide? The answer is yes. So here's some algae. It's a replica. It's not real algae, but here's what it would look like in the ocean. This is seaweed. And it's still making its own oxygen, but it has to exchange the carbon dioxide it makes. So as all living things do what they do every day, 
we make carbon dioxide. You breathe in more oxygen, you let out some carbon dioxide. All living things do that. So algae does do that, but they just kind of do it through what we would consider their skin. The parts of an algae, all right here, the things that look like leaves are called blades. And then the stems, like you would think on a plant, these are called stipes. And all over their body, they can exchange nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide. They don't have to have just a single part, like we have lungs, or a fish has gills. They exchange this across their entire body. So that is how algae would breathe. So while you're watching, remember you can text some questions in to our number down below. We have another fun question from Natasha. How, how are the penguins? The penguins are doing really well. We'll take a look at the penguin cam in just a little bit because it's a fun time of year for the penguins. Don't worry, Natasha, we'll get to the penguins in just a few minutes. Now that we've made a couple observations, you've taken a little bit of time, what did you notice are some differences about the animals? And then we'll talk about how they survive in a cold water habitat. One of the first things you might notice is there's a lot different color. There's not as many brightly colored fish. There's only a couple. We saw the Garibaldi swam away. He was back in this corner over here. We saw the Garibaldi briefly, but there's not as many bright colors. What color do most of the fish appear to be? Like here's one of our half moons right here. We have some sardines swimming in a school up top here. We even have the, I think these are the mackerel. That, that's our mackerel school coming around the back. What color do we notice most fish tend to be? They're kind of a silver or a gray. What's the, why would you want to be silver or gray in this habitat? Do you see as many colors in the rocks in the surrounding area? Not exactly. So if you want to be a brightly colored animal like our Garibaldi, you better have a very important reason if you're going to completely stand out from everybody else. If you're not brightly colored, you blend in with the rocks in the darker, murkier water. It's tougher to see in. But in a coral reef, it's very bright, clear water. And the coral itself is very brightly colored too. So you want to blend in with those similar features of your habitat. Well, the Garibaldi, well, oh, he disappeared on me. The Garibaldi is very brightly colored, but it's kind of okay. Even though that fish does not get very big, the Garibaldi are very territorial. Now, even if you're a big fish, like a giant sea bass, of which I don't see any down here right now, for two reasons. One, the giant sea bass are way high in the exhibit, and this is the right time of year for them to be near the surface, but also the Garibaldi get territorial, and they'll shove even the big fish out of a space that they consider their little home. They want to protect a potential nest, so the Garibaldi will even chase people. One of our friends here in the aquarium, she was diving one time, and it came right up to their goggles and was poking them in the goggles. Didn't matter what they did until they swam farther away from where the Garibaldi was hanging out. The Garibaldi wouldn't leave them alone. So that's another behavioral adaptation. How do you make sure your babies would survive? Well, you have to be sometimes a little aggressive to make sure that bigger fish don't get into your nest. All right, we have a couple of really cool questions down here. Oh, there's one of our Garibaldi. So sea otter adaptation. Sea otters do live in the kelp forest habitat like this. But they don't dive for very long, maybe three to five minutes. So if they can't get underwater for very long, but they have to find food, where do you think they're going to get their food from? Do you think they eat the fish? Maybe once in a while, not always. More often, they would be eating stuff that's off the ground like sea stars, urchins, abalone, Maybe even some crabs too. So they eat the little animals that live off the sea floor. So they go down and can very quickly get to about 100 feet of water within three minutes, go all the way to the bottom, pick up some pieces of food, go all the way back up to the top, and then feed on it. But they can't carry too much, but they do carry a few pieces of food. They lie on their back and they can open up anything with shells because they have their favorite little rock hiding in their armpit. They have an extra large armpit. It's not like it's a pocket like we think of like a pocket in my jacket, but it is an extra space that they will hide their favorite rock or shell. They pull it out and they can crack that open. Really cool otter adaptation. They don't all know how to eat the same things. Their mothers teach them how to eat certain kinds of food. 
So that's also a really interesting adaptation that only some otters know how to eat certain kinds of food. All right, a couple other really fun questions. Why are the white or why do eagle rays have white spots and why is their tail so long? The eagle ray has a couple of different color adaptations. Did you notice that their back was a different color than their belly? Let's pull up our tropical webcam again. We'll see if we can find the stingrays. There are stingrays that live in California, just like this exhibit would be here, but we don't have any in our blue cavern habitat. So we'll jump back over to our tropical reef habitat so that we can take a look at some stingrays. Good question while we're waiting to see some stingrays is what if there was no coral? So all this stuff that's in here is a replica of a coral reef. It doesn't grow very long. Oh, here's a couple stingrays. These are the cow nose rays. Let's see if one of our eagle rays might swim by. If you imagine you held out your hand about like this, this much space, that's about how much coral might grow in one year, maybe an inch. Now imagine you had this 25 foot tall wall of coral. How long is that? It could be thousands of years. So coral doesn't grow very quickly, but it's also incre incredibly important. Remember we said it has algae that lives inside of it? That algae makes oxygen not only for the coral, but for everybody. So almost 60% of the oxygen that even that we breathe comes from the ocean. So we have to make sure that we take care of it. If there were no coral, there wouldn't be enough oxygen on the planet for most animals to survive. Now, do we find our eagle rays? I think they might be hiding on us. If you watch one of the animals come around that has this color pattern called counter shading, the sharks have it too. They're lighter on their belly than they are on their back. Let's see if we can find somebody with counter shading. Oh, here we go. Here's an eagle ray. So you notice we have spots on the back in a darker pattern. If you look down at an animal in the water, the darkness helps them blend in. If you're underneath them, the light pattern can help them blend in with the sunlight. So sometimes spots and color shading will help you blend into your environment. Now we have some requests for a couple different exhibits. Now remember Natasha wanted to look at penguins. So let's take a look at our penguins first and then we'll jump into our jelly habitat. The penguins are a very cool bird. We have a really large colony or a group of penguins here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Our penguin habitat doesn't look like it always does because right now, it's breeding season. Every once in a while, we get a very large group of penguin babies that hatch here at the aquarium. So during the springtime, when they would be trying to have babies, we put extra branches and leaves in the exhibit so they can build their nest. They're also a little bit less likely to go swimming because they want to stick close to a nest. So you can, might see all these little palm frond pieces in the exhibit. We've put them in there just so they can make themselves a nest. Here's one of our penguins. So you remember we talked about light belly color and dark color on your back? Even the penguins have some counter shading. That is not a penguin over there. Don't confuse our two friends of birds. Sometimes the gulls do land inside, but the penguins, they're not especially friendly with gulls. Gulls are opportunistic. They wait for a chance to get food, but nobody's feeding the penguins right now, so they're not gonna get anything. Our penguins weren't too upset about there being a seagull in the exhibit, and that's okay. They don't really need to be. But take a look at our penguin. Do penguins fly in the air? I've never seen a penguin fly in the air. Their bodies just aren't built for that. Their adaptations made it so that they only hang out in the water or on the beach when they're trying to have their babies. They'll nest right into the sand of the beaches of Chile and Argentina. Now, take a look at the penguin's shape. Now that it's laying down, you can kind of see what it might be like underwater. I kind of compare them to bowling pins. They're aerodynamic, almost like a little torpedo, but their wings are adapted just to fly underwater. It helps them push while they're going underwater. You might try being a penguin around your living room while we're all hanging out at home right now. And then their big feet. Take a look at these penguin feet. Their feet are not for kicking to, to keep them going. It's for steering. So their bodies have adapted in a very similar way to that birds that fly. The wings are moving forward and then the 
feet are for helping steer, whereas a bird that's flying, their tail would help them steer. So our penguins look like they're pretty happy. They're doing well in there. Oh, there's that seagull again. Now remember, these are our live webcams. You can log on to our website, aquariumofpacific.org, and check out any of the webcams we've talked about today, and you can hang out with our lovely animals whenever you'd like. Okay, we had another request for the jellies. So let's go hang out with animals that are nothing like what we talked about so far, except for their cousins. And we'll see if we can figure out who their cousins were. The jelly exhibit is a little bit different. Jellies are simpler animals, but they're really complex for how simple they are. And we'll talk about some of their special adaptations about how they survive in their habitat. Now jellies belong to a group where they all have stinging cells. So if you look at a jelly, if you've heard anything about jellies, do you know where their stinging cells are at? When the Aquarium of the Pacific is normally open, we have a jelly touch lab where you can touch a species of jelly called the moon jelly. Their tentacles, that's dark lines that follow right after the body. Those are the stinging tentacles. Really good example right here. So those dark stripes, those are the stinging tentacles. And the big fluffy ones are their feeding arms. So this, those are some tentacles right on our screen. Now these tentacles that are trying to grab me, I guess. These help grab the food. It stings their prey and stuns it. And they get stuck to the tentacles. And then the feeding arms, the fluffy tentacles right there, those will pull the food off the stinging tentacles and slowly move it where? What's the next part of the animal that the food would have to go into? If you have a cheeseburger in your hands or an apple, what do you do with it? You got to take a bite out of it. So jellies do have mouths, but they don't have teeth. They just kind of open their mouth and engulf the food whole. The moon jellies that we would be able to touch here at the aquarium, they're not eating bigger items like these sea nettles. The moon jellies eat little tiny stuff called plankton. But the sea nettles, as long as you have big tentacles, you could eat bigger things. So they're surviving by grabbing their food. Does it look like the jellies swim very fast? Are they like those fish that were really quickly moving through the water? They just kind of bob, do one of these things. Jellies are not good swimmers. They're also considered plankton. So that motion you see with the bell where they just kind of close, they're very slowly swimming in a particular pattern. But they really can't go everywhere they want to. If you notice, the holes in the bottom of our exhibit here are so that we can create a special current that keeps them moving around. They're not even really strong enough to not get stuck to one of the walls. So this very gentle current just gradually moves them around the exhibit. And that way, they can find food because they can only eat if they bump into it. And then they can also make sure that they don't get injured by sticking to one surface for too long. Let's see if we can make a couple more observations of our jellies. We're going to see if we can pull up another type of jelly picture for you all. This is the crystal jelly. Now this one is a lot smaller. Even though the picture makes them look real big, those sea nettles are about this big around. The crystal jellies are a lot smaller. You can see their long tentacles too. Depending on what kind of jelly you are, you have bigger or smaller tentacles, or longer or shorter is a little bit more accurate. The biggest jelly in the world looks more like this. It's not this one, but it's a type of jelly called a lion's mane jelly. It's a group of jellies, and the biggest of the lion's mane jellies can be longer than a bus. Their tentacles can stretch over 60 feet. The bell, the main part of the body, is like four feet wide. That's a big jelly. But then the smallest jellies are really, really tiny. So jellies have a wide variety of sizes and abilities. This is the spotted lagoon jelly. They don't nearly even hunt for food or plankton a lot of the time. They're kind of like their cousins where they have an algae living inside their body. Do you remember what that animal was? It's a coral. Corals have algae that live inside of them. And so do some jellies. It's an interesting adaptation. So the jellies, the corals, and the anemones all have stinging cells. Here's a really great picture of these cousins we call the cnidarians. So there's the anemone. We didn't really get to see one of them yet. The anemones have these big tentacles too. 
that belly button looking thing in the mouth in the middle is the mouth and they don't have eyes and they don't have brains so how do they survive what do you need to survive all these different adaptations we talked about coloring ability to feed stinging cells having other things live inside you that help you get food but what does all that mean what do you need to survive well you have to be able to get energy in some way so algae make it from the sunlight just like plants do animals have to eat stuff for energy just like the anemone will so you have to be able to get energy either from sunlight or other chemical sources or you have to eat it well you also have to be able to live in a specific kind of habitat maybe you're only able to live in a certain temperature range or level of light coral like this brain coral can only really live in the top 200 meters of the water it needs enough sunlight for that algae that lives inside of it to survive other coral has to be very deep because it does not have that need for the sunlight so you have to have energy consumption in some way you have to be able to move around do you think this thing moves around is it rolling across the seafloor no but when it was a little baby tiny plankton you actually can see some of the little plankton dots in the water here when they're real tiny they're able to move around the ocean pushes them around as plankton and then they land somewhere and they grow into the coral you see right here so at some point they're able to move they're getting energy but things also have to be able to have babies in order for the whole species to survive some of them have to reproduce and different animals have different ways to have babies all right we have some time for some questions so we talked about temperature do animals survive in different temperatures really interesting question would the penguins survive in our tropical habitat let's think about the habitat of the magellanic penguin did you see any ice in there i didn't see any ice they live in a very similar habitat to california they're in the southern hemisphere though but the water temperature the air all the different weather patterns are very similar to what we have here do you think the animals that live in southern california would be able to survive in a tropical reef not too many of them so there's just temperature differences food differences that they won't be able to survive in so they have to stay in a particular style of habitat now kayla asked about some sea otter adaptations sea otters have been a popular topic today so here's some sea otters this is one of ours here at the aquarium of the pacific they're not great at walking around on land, are they? They're much better at swimming in the water. Now, the food that we gave them, remember, they would be grabbing them off the sea floor, coming back up to the surface, like a piece of clam. So the sea otters are grabbing their food off the sea floor. They have this really thick fur. You can see the fur right here that allows them to be in cold water. They don't have a blubber layer like seals or sea lions. Let's actually look at some seals or sea lions, just to give you a little bit difference. The sea lions, they don't have the, that really thick, long fur like a sea otter does, but they do have blubber to keep them warm. Now, Parker, our big boy right here, he's got this big forehead. The big males, when they're adults, their forehead gets bigger, and that's how you can tell it's an adult male. Now, if it has a smaller forehead like this one, it might be a young male or it might be a female. You kind of have to wait until they grow up a little bit more to figure out what they are. Now, seals and sea lions are in a different group from the sea otters. Even though they're brown, furry animals, they're very different. Sea otters are more like a badger or a wolverine. Seals and sea lions are not. They have flippers, so they can swim in the water. They have these really big whiskers, just like sea otters do. But remember, their fur is a little different. Very thin fur. And the seals and the sea lions are much better swimmers and divers. Seals can dive for almost an hour depending on what type the elephant seal can dive for an hour and our own harbor seals that live here in the aquarium of the pacific can dive for up to a half an hour whereas sea otters there's only a few minutes if they can get down that far now one group of animals we talked about earlier but let's take a closer look at are the sharks there's a lot of fish in our shark lagoon besides sharks while we make some observations of our animals here i have a few more questions that our friends have been asking so someone asked how old do the penguins get 
Penguins out in the ocean might only live around 10 to 15 years. We had a penguin that lived almost 20. So he, under human care, where there's constant food available, good health care for them, we're monitoring them all the time, they have a better chance of living longer than they would out in the ocean. Do penguins waddle or swim faster? That's a very fun question. We didn't get to see the penguins swimming. Now, I can waddle faster than a penguin, but I can't swim faster than a penguin. Penguins can swim about 15 miles an hour. Now, the last question I think we have time for today comes from Hannah asking, what is the largest fish? Oh, here's our sea turtle trying to come out. We're going to show you a picture of the largest fish on the planet. Do you recognize who this is? This is the whale shark. Sharks are fish. They have all the other same adaptations and characteristics of a fish, so they count as the largest fish. And they're so big, they're longer than a school bus. The longest recorded whale shark was longer than a bus, almost 65 feet. The average whale shark you might see is around 30 to 40 feet, which is almost the same length as a school bus. That's a pretty big fish. Do you see any teeth in that mouth? I don't really see any teeth in there. They have a very cool jaw. I actually have an example of a jaw right here in our studio. That's a big mouth with very minimal teeth. What are whale sharks eating? We've talked about this kind of animal a lot today already. Whale sharks are eating plankton, just like a whole bunch of other animals we talked about today. They filter with their gills. So the plankton, as they swim around, flies into their mouth, and they have these extra parts of their gills to help capture the plankton as the water moves through, just allowing them to breathe. Well, this is a lot of amazing adaptations we talked about today. All these animals have a very specific way to survive in their habitats. Thank you so much for texting in your questions. My friend that's working in the studio over here trying to answer as many as possible, I think we'll keep going. But thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And... Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday on the Aquarium Online Academy.